So hello everyone and welcome to this very special uh, webinar that uh, Department of Geopolitics and International Relations is organizing in association with the Center for Climate Studies and the UNESCO Peace Chair, which has been set up at Manipal Academy of High, Higher Education back in 2009 uh, for the promotion of the culture of peace and non-violence across the world. Uh, so today we are going to discuss a very important issue. In fact, uh, climate change and peace. What are the interlinkages between climate change and peace? We just celebrated on the 21st of September the International Day of Peace. We also had a session in the United Nations Security Council on climate change and security implications. Uh, and we've seen a lot of discussions around climate change and how does it affect peace and security in the world. To discuss this very important issue, we have with us two eminent uh, and distinguished speakers, um, Anna Brack from uh, Geneva Center for Security Policy and Ollie Brown, uh, who wears a number of hats, among which, uh, of course, GCSP is one, but also uh, Chatham House in Adelphi. Uh, so it's a pleasure uh, to invite you both to this event today, uh, uh, which is uh, which is also being actually held in the background of Gandhi Jayanti, uh, which is actually on the 2nd of October, which is tomorrow. So therefore, it's a pleasure once again to invite you both uh, to and also hosting you virtually uh, uh, in this particular event. Uh, so before I introduce both of you to our audience and also formally uh, uh, talking more about some of these issues, uh, let me first invite uh, Dr. Nand Kishore, head of the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations to uh, give the welcome remarks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dhanashree. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure um, to have uh, Anna as well as uh, Oli in, in this particular event. As I was just mentioning in the informal discussion that it's perhaps one of the noble ways of uh, celebrating Gandhi Jayanti and perhaps the most meaningful way if we have to because perhaps he was one individual who stayed so close to the nature and uh, he always thought as such India itself had a greater connection with nature and we were always one with nature that was his thought. I think uh, perhaps it would have pained him the most had he been alive to see uh, what the what the world is going through in terms of looking at uh, climate change and the way uh, things are getting out of hand and now we are discussing a very important connection that is climate change and peace itself because the very uh, how do I put it it probably that the compound character that we are trying to look at uh, climate change itself as some sort of an exogenous factor uh, it shapes a lot of local context for peace building in fact if you look at the type of issues that are going on in Syria, in Afghanistan, all those places where civil wars are already there. And then you have some of the states which are extremely fragile in nature itself, where it has led to massive amount of, let's say, marginalization. Uh, and there are too many grievances that are existing. On top of it, now the world uh, with globalization is absolutely dependent on, on, on the fruits of globalization. But unfortunately, the same globalization also divides people and those places where they are unable to capture or where unable to fulfill to the economic requirements or the economic development component this becomes further uh, a major case of concern when it when it comes to the issues of let's say livelihood now that livelihood dep is dependent on agriculture and agriculture is dependent on the scenario in that particular country the peace that is existing in that country and that peace has been disturbed essentially because of the things that are happening with things like climate change. I think this is a it, it is a challenge that uh, that world is going to face more and more severe. Not none of them would be spared. It can be most prosperous nation, but at the same time, it's not uh, immune to any of these. So extreme weather conditions are going to be a new normal in most of the places in last. Let's say our, our rains here, the monsoon was supposed to end uh, almost a month ago, but we have been seeing not less than four or five times they've been saying there is depression and then uh, we have so much of change suddenly we have a day uh, or a week uh, completely sunny again it, it rains for uh, weeks together we have these extreme conditions that are coming in which one has to brace in such situations where the fragility has taken place in most of the places where we are unable to respond to what are the ways how do we deal with 
and what are the type of impacts that is going to have in terms of preventing conflict because in the western thought on on peace itself is the absence of war or absence of conflict whereas in our uh, in the eastern side it is it's a bit different which i i keep emphasizing many a times that for us it's also harmony uh, in living it's also about the peace that we anticipate to be sync with the nature now keeping that in mind i think the topic that we are discussing today is extremely important uh in terms of climate change and peace and uh, we at the department of geopolitics and international relations we've been 11 years uh, since the masters and phd program has begun here and we have a full fledged course on climate change and environmental security uh, which at a point of time dr danushri was a student now she is a teacher and she is also teaching here and we have been encouraging lot of students to uh, work on these topics looking at several aspects of climate change and environmental security i think both of your uh, presence and and the lecture would add more uh, value to what we are doing far and we certainly would want to establish contacts we would want to have that cross cultural understanding we would want to have more and more interactions with the other side because as long as we are living in silos i don't think we'll ever be able to find solutions to these type of problems which are universal right these are universal problems but they require local solutions but that can happen only when we have these type of interaction share best practices or bring in better frameworks that can amalgamate the ones which are existing here and then sync it so that we all together can contribute to the nature that we all love so much and there's no survival without it i think that's precisely why uh, we wanted something like this to happen as we mentioned i think it's perhaps the most meaningful way we are celebrating uh, gandhi's uh, birthday and along with it a very very important event which we were supposed to have the, on the saturday we are happy that both of you could make it and uh, we appreciate your uh, gesture and uh, over to you dr danishri thank you so much uh, dr nand kishore so since he has given such a great introduction i really don't think i need to uh, provide any more remarks and maybe uh, what i can do is you know start by introducing both the speakers and then i will invite uh, uh, anna first and then followed by oli uh, so anna will be giving a brief uh, background to what are the like i mentioned interlinkages between climate change and peace and security generally and also the involvement of various international and regional organizations in that sense and as to how they engage with this uh, with this uh, with this new predicament that we are looking at in various contexts oli who has worked across the world in fact uh, on this on this particular issue uh, but uh, he will also reflect in specific on the situation in afghanistan considering the situation now uh, which is of course it is still fluid in nature we don't know what is the kind of system that is coming in place so one of the things that is going to be discussed in the future uh, in afghanistan as well would be how is climate change going to interact with the security situation in that uh, country so let me not uh, let me not waste any more time uh, i would like to introduce both the speakers um, anna brack uh, who is a very good friend of mine she is the head of human security at uh, geneva center for security policy her work focuses on issues of environmental and health security with special emphasis on the climate change and security nexus her research interests include human security human rights environmental security climate change global public uh, uh, commons and resource management uh, she is responsible for developing and running the human security cluster activities including executive courses workshops and high level conferences in geneva and internationally uh, she is a course director for the european security course and in fact she is also uh, she is also involved with environmental security course that the gcsp offers um she will give a, you know she will be in a position to give a very good perspective from a practitioner's perspective also from an educator's perspective because she constantly engages with the uh, uh, with experts and with diplomats and other uh, uh, you know higher level or mid level officials within the un who constantly engage with the topic of environment itself um and our second speaker of the day is oli brown uh, as i mentioned he wears a number of hats of course uh, uh, today uh, he will be speaking about afghanistan and uh, climate security in afghanistan and i have already shared in fact uh, a risk brief that he wrote about afghanistan for the climate security expert network uh, 
uh, with the students of the department. Uh, in any case, uh, he's a senior associate at uh, at the Adelphi Berlin. He's also an associate fellow with the Geneva Center for Security Policy, and he's an associate fellow with the Energy, Environment and Resources Program uh, in uh, Chatham House. Uh, between 2014 and 2018, Oli was based in Kenya, where he coordinated UN environment programs work to minimize the risks and impacts of disasters, industrial accidents and armed conflicts. Uh, and before that, uh, 2010 and 12, he managed a UN uh, environment program in Sierra Leone. And before that, he was a senior researcher and program manager with the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Uh, he has specialist knowledge in environmental management, peace building and conflict analysis, trade policy, migration policy, climate change and extractives. He has worked, as I mentioned, on all these issues across the world. In fact, uh, in Africa, uh, in, uh, in DRC, Kenya, Liberia and Sierra Leone. In Asia, he has worked in Afghanistan, Nepal and Thailand, Middle East, in Syria, Palestine, Lebanon and Israel and uh, in Bolivia in Latin America. So as you can see, he's covered pretty much the whole world there. And uh, uh, I'm sure it would be uh, you know wonderful for our students to listen to you and get to know more about these connections, which very often, by the way, we all try to, you know, we all tend to uh, ignore and, uh, you know, we never really reach that position where we are able to actually acknowledge these very important linkages that exist between peace and socioeconomic conditions and environmental conditions and other issues. So without much ado, I would like to first invite Anna to uh, to provide her uh, you know, talk. Yeah. Thank you so much, Danashri. I'm going to try to share my screen because uh, I have to apologize to the public. I do have a PowerPoint presentation. And I'm going to uh, show it to you right now. Uh, voila, here it is. So what I wanted to do, I do not have mu much time. And thank you so much, uh, Dana Shri, for inviting me and also, also giving me the opportunity to speak about something that I'm not used to speaking really because I, I mostly take a look at the climate change and security perspective. So I will talk to you about all the threats that climate change poses in the security and how it changes the, the security landscape. And here I wanted to talk a more about peace and, and, and you know, the peace efforts uh, uh, around uh, around the world like globally and also the regional level that we are we are making now. So climate for peace, just a, just a few words about it. I wanted to, to mention some policy directions that I can see now uh, visible in, you know, in different in different uh, Fora. Um, I will speak to you a little bit about the regional efforts and planetary efforts, and I do like to uh, use the planet planet word instead of using global word because planet kind of brings us all together and kind of re makes us realize how you know we are basically living it living on this uh, on this one spaceship you know floating in the in the in uh, in the universe and you know how we have to actually take care of of the spaceship uh, all together. And finally, I will have some key messages. Uh, so first, uh, climate for peace. So what we understand uh, from, you know, from research and from basically, you know, the, 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 um, the professionals with whom I'm interacting in my in the context of the of the Geneva Center for Security Policy, we can see that climate change impacts are shaping now the peace and security landscape. So, you know, be it, uh, you know, movement of people, be it uh, um, availability of natural resources, be it even impact on conflict, you know, for the time being, you know, there's the jury still out there on, you know, how climate change actually is impacting conflict. But, uh, but, but there is, uh, there is some evidence showing at least, uh, at least the local conflict is, uh, can be exacerbated by, by by climate change. Second point here is really that the climate environmental issues are present throughout the conflict cycle. So we have to, you know, when when, when you look at the conflict cycle from conflict prevention, conflict, uh, you know, uh, like peace, uh, peace uh, making, keeping, and then peace building, you will see environmental uh, elements uh, throughout. And, you know, climate change, of course, uh, is uh, is one of the uh, elements. So and one, uh, on one hand, you can see them as, as, as root causes, but at the same time, you can see the, the, the climate change uh, uh, challenges as uh, as peace building opportunities. So while addressing uh, climate change uh, risks, you may uh, you may actually uh, be creating conditions for uh, for building peace and creating uh, more sustainable uh, societies. And last but not least, for for this uh, for this first slide is really that drivers of conflict stay the same. So you know that the research for the time being is not showing us that that climate change has become the major you know uh, 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 cause of conflict, but 
it's there is there is this uh, this correlation element that uh, that is still there and you as uh, as as students you you know you of course uh, realize this uh, difference between correlation and causation so 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 really being very cautious uh, cautious about, about it but at the same time and me being head of uh, human security at the GCSP and thinking a lot in terms of uh, prevention you actually uh, can see uh, you know kind of it links on to my former point it it really um, the cli addressing climate change can actually um, uh, provide prevention uh, opportunities uh, in different fragile and, uh, and and conflict situations. So or almost conflict situations. So are we now speaking? And and, and I was very happy to to to, to hear uh, Nanda mention this uh, this this you know these different approaches to peace because because you can see peace as you know negative the so-called negative peace which is the the basically absence of conflict. But I'm thinking that in in the context of climate and peace, it's uh, we are actually talking about positive peace. So positive peace means that we are creating conditions for societies to thrive, for human beings to thrive within these societies, and uh, and securing uh, the 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 life of uh, of people for uh, for the future. Um, uh, so now I will show you a little bit uh, a few points about the climate and uh, climate and peace policy directions that I can ident uh, I've identified from my from my analysis. You know, watch and t talking to my uh, to my students as well at the at the DCSP. So first of all, it's really this better communication with all the stakeholders, kind of communicating about the importance of of these issues. And you know, we can. Uh, like Oli and myself were actually in, a, in, in this meeting on, on the NATO um, um, strategic concept, the, the, the strategic concept that's going to be, uh, um, uh, you know, developed uh, shortly, is being developed actually. And, and, and one of the points in this meeting was that, uh, that actually the communication is, uh, is still lacking, that we, you know, we uh, talking to ourselves in our echo chambers, we, are, we all understand this, uh, this linkage, but, but there are still people, and even, you know, people who are working in peace and security, who are still not realizing these, uh, these issues. So I think that the first, uh, the, the first point is really Im improving communication, kind of foc focusing on the, on the communication. Second is integrated analysis. So really this is about connecting the dots and uh, seeing different um, uh, security challenges as being interconnected, as precisely having this, uh, this, this planetary approach. Of course, you know, you always have to be context specific, but at the same time, you need to be able to connect uh, for example, non-proliferation efforts uh, to, uh, to you know to what's happening in the in the in the, the climate security uh, climate security agenda. Then really building resilience. So it's coming back again to this uh, positive peace uh, positive peace um, uh, pledge to uh, to really building the resilience of societies so that they so they can better respond to uh, to climate uh, to climate um, uh, risks. And you know you can see very clearly you know there are some countries so much so you when you go to the Netherlands that you know is affected by the sea level rise for example this society is quite resilient and and, and can respond to this uh, to, to this risk much better than you know and for example your, your neighboring country Bangladesh who is facing similar uh, si similar uh, challenges then mitigation adaptation efforts so of course these are the policies that you know that they can you know we can go into details of, 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 of both of these so you know really putting the, uh, the, them both on on on, on all, almost equal uh, uh, equal uh, place, uh, you know, adaptation, of course, uh, leading to, to, to better, to being better prepared and very much linked to resilience as well. And at the same time, mitigation efforts to to reduce the, the, the emissions to uh, to and also take care of the of, of the of the um, uh, um, uh, of the environment, of the biosphere, of to taking care of the um, uh, the biodiversity as well, because what we are forgetting in uh, that that sometimes mitigation efforts can actually uh, lead to uh, to un, uh, unintended uh, consequences, uh, like for example extracting minerals in uh, you know risk uh, areas. These minerals that will be now you know used in the in the context of uh, you know producing different te 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 um, technological devices to you know to to emit less emissions. So this is really we have to think about it having, having kind of this uh, uh, 360 uh, approach to this. Uh, then you know thinking in terms of integrated responses. You know there's the whole government uh, uh, need. So so having different elements of government really working together in order to uh, to think in terms of peace and, uh, and 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 climate and of course whole of society approach. So this is also this. Uh, 
uh, proposition of the of human security approach where you are actually bringing together different actors uh, including of course you know the civil society the ngos the the media uh, and the and the private sector to work together into uh, you know to to uh, um, to address the the, the climate and peace uh, conversation and then of course last but not least but but really very important and it also came up very strongly in this uh, in, in the meeting uh, we, we had on uh, on uh, discussing nato uh, is how do you go from short term uh, approaches to, to to really be more long term and future uh, informed so having these strategic foresight really approaches to uh, to planning for and preparing for the different uh, futures preparing for different scenarios and thinking in terms of how you're going to uh, uh, to, to, to address, uh, you know, s mm, climate security risk and at the same time, you know, creating a better, uh, a, mm, better environment for, for creating peace, for, cre for, for doing peace building, um, etc. So how, how is it done? And this, my next slide is really about uh, the, the different regional efforts. I'm not going to go into details. This slide is mostly focused on, uh, or rather based on, uh, on the excellent work that uh, Stockholm Peace uh, Research Institute is doing, so the CIPRI. I'm going to uh, send Dana Shri my, uh, my, uh, my PowerPoint uh, with a slide with all the resources that I've been, uh, I've been um, uh, mentioning because I think it's really important that, you know, if you're interested to, to be able to do, uh, to do more research on this. But just to have like a different, uh, different uh, um, uh, points of of of, uh, of information here. Uh, so first of all, Europe, of course, you know, close to my heart, and I, I you know, I originally can probably hear from my accent. I'm not a, a native English speaker. I actually come from Poland, Eastern Eastern Europe, uh, and uh, and I wanted to start talking about uh, about what's uh, what's being done in Europe. And you know, I, I chose these three uh, organizations: the European Union, the NATO, um, <clears throat> and then uh, OEC, so the Organization for Security and uh, Cooperation in Europe on, on on the Europe on the Europe uh, um, uh, organization. So what's being done on the re on the regional level? As you, as you probably know, within Europe, there is not much of a, like, you know, there are, of course, some conflicts uh, going on, especially in the OECE area. But uh, but in general, uh, European countries uh, tend to be the kind of the proponents of this uh, uh, climate security, uh, climate security uh, uh, um, 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 conversation. A lot of them are really on the forefront of, of the of this conversation. Like, for example, Germany that is just running the, the uh, climate security conference that's as, as, as we are speaking. Um, and for example, you know that the EU, so European Union is one of the organizations that, you know, is already talking about uh, climate uh, climate climate and, and, and security in its global strategy. So it's this general document that, that kind of defines the direction of the of the whole organization. Uh, there is a there's a climate change in defense roadmap with, where, 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 uh, where um, uh, European Union positions itself as one of the organizations that actually is trying to, to include the, the, uh, the climate security and climate and peace uh, conversation in its, uh, in its, um, in its uh, activities. Uh, secondly, the NATO, the same. So, so it has been already uh, the, 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 in the strategic conference uh, concept of NATO in 2010 already mentioned the, the climate, uh, climate and security. And now, you know, with the conversations about the new strategy upcoming new strategic concept the conversation is still being uh, being continued and you know with with an increased uh, with an increased element of, of, of climate security uh, and you know and, and kind of integrating this also in the in in, in, in NATO missions right and uh, last but not least OEC OEC is a very interesting conversation for and for public uh, outside of Europe it's not very well known but I really like it because from the beginning from the onset actually one of the dimensions of the OEC comprehensive security um, uh, approach is is actually uh, one of the pillars is environment and uh, environment is always present so you know when you speak to people who work within the OEC they might tell you you know this is something that is always sacrificed on the altar of the you know political processes but at the same time OEC is trying to 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 uh, to um, uh, to implement uh, to kind of integrate this conversation in their in the work uh, they for example have learned I'm sorry I'm just looking at my at my notes because it's uh, in tw uh, 2020 the OEC uh, OEC launched an extra budgetary pro uh, project focusing on climate related security risks in Central Asia in uh, Eastern Europe and South Caucasus and East uh, and Southeastern Europe so you see that you know they are really looking into how to uh, how to in integrate a conversation about climate in uh, in its uh, in its conversation then second 
secondly, you know, moving on to Africa, and you know, Oli knows much more about this uh, as uh, as I do. But but you know, in, within the African Union, the conversation is there, and uh, and uh, you know, there is there is a mention of this uh, of of climate, of course, consideration in the in the. Um, uh, um, 2064 uh, agenda. So this is kind of something similar to the 2030 agenda, but with uh, for African countries, uh, you know, with a uh, with a longer time scope. Um, and 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 climate is also part of the Af part of the conversation. In March 2021, Africa, the, the the African Union Peace and Security Council issued a communique. Uh, talking about precisely how climate change is really important to the efforts of, of the African Union in uh, addressing uh, uh, security concerns and, build, and peace building efforts. So this is this is kind of kind of fresh and, uh, and 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 important as well. But still, the the the, the criticism of 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 this, the the African approach is really that you know it still stays on the level of declarations. Uh, but what about uh, applying it to the to you know in in practice? How to how to move to uh, to Action and it's also a, a challenge of bringing, you know, so 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 there is the the organizational level, but then there is the level of individual member states who are dealing with a lot of different security challenges, uh, and where uh, you know climate uh, climate change can uh, uh, can drop to the you know lower on the list of priorities, let's say, in in addressing in addressing these uh, these uh, security uh, challenges. The same goes for the for, 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 for the ECOWAS, so the Economic Community of uh, Western uh, West African States, who have these you know very ambitious declarations as well. But but then you know the the uh, the, the devils in the details as, as always in kind of in implementation, and this is uh, this is a challenge. I won't going I won't go too much into Asia, but you know just just to just to think in terms of you know ASEAN. Uh, or the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So all of these organizations are actually talking about climate and and and, and security, and and very interestingly, precisely in this in this uh, livelihood approach. So it's more human security approach, right? And thinking in terms of how to create peaceful uh, peaceful societies, you know, accounting for the impacts of climate change. And here, uh, this is mostly done in. Two kind of subject areas, and you know, you, you will of course be able to to, to correct me. Uh, one is uh, is of course the disaster relief because this is uh, or management because because this is one of the the regions that is really he heavily hit by different uh, natural uh, disasters. And secondly, uh, really the conversation about food security that actually the, the insecurity is hitting. Uh, Quite a lot of countries, and this food insecurity is actually exacerbated by climate change. Uh, so again, uh, in, in in all the organizations, you know, on the declaration level, there is uh, there is uh, there is quite a strong not strong language, but the, there is some language on this. But at the same time, you know, there is there is a uh, there is an implementation uh, challenge there. And then, if I was wearing my uh, sharing my screen, I would then go to the planetary efforts. So, how is it done on the on the planetary level? And of course, you know the most the most important actor on the planetary level would be the United Nations, of course. And uh, you know, starting with the United Nations Security Council, that is, uh, as you know. Uh, um, uh, yeah, not really representative to the to to to, to the uh, uh, to how the world looks uh, looks like now with the P5, you know, kind of uh, um, co concentrating uh, its power. And it was very interesting because I I was just watching the um, um, uh, UNGA, so, so United Nations uh, General Assembly speeches of the heads of states. And what was interesting that actually climate change and 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 uh, was coming up uh, quite a lot. But at the same time, I was also watching the uh, the, the the discussion of the United Nations Security uh, Council that happened just uh, just uh, just a week ago uh, when the climate change was discussed and where two of the five uh, permanent member states, uh, namely Russia and China, were talking about how climate change is actually should not be on the uh, Kind of should not be on the agenda of 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 of, uh, of uh, Security Council because you know only in specific uh, in specific um, uh, situations uh, in specific contexts, but not really as a something like the the Women, Peace and Security uh, Resolution. I don't really see with these two countries being opposed to it happening on the on the climate and security uh, level. Uh, then uh, you have the Department of Political Peacekeeping Affairs that is quite uh, strongly uh, you know talking about this. Uh, uh, you know they they have included climate uh, um, in their strategic plan for 2020 2022 and I, I i can imagine that it will be uh, continued uh, continued in the future and of course you know talking about the integrated approaches and uh, uh, you know also addressing the 
the the the, um, the plea for of, of vulnerable um, uh, uh, communities or you know groups like women like children that that are um, that are struck more by the by the by the um, uh, um, effects of climate change. Then, uh, of course, the development of uh, peace operations, where uh, with 80% of the uh, of, of of the of the of the of the missions are actually deployed in in countries that are that are struck by the um, uh, by um, but, uh, that are affected by uh, by uh, climate change, and this is really an important uh, piece of information for the uh, you know for for the policymakers and for the you know for the countries that are involved in peacemaking because uh, peacekeeping because because you have to account for climate change and you know one of the missions that is very like a poster child now of this uh, of these efforts is uh, the mission in Somalia where you know there is their special representative appointed for uh, for for environmental issues. Now I don't know how it works in in practice, but at least you know on the on paper and even on, on in uh, you know Oli can 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 mention something more because I think that his his experience is also very relevant here uh, and I, I wonder about your thoughts about this and of course last but not least in the in the context of climate uh, of climate uh, of U United Nations it's of course this climate security mechanism that is a cooperation between the the different organ so the uh, DPPA uh, the program for uh, development and the environmental program so this is a, a mechanism that puts together people from these different organizations that are thinking in terms of accounting for uh, different security uh, risks uh, coming from climate change and how to implement them in the in the different contexts in which uh, the UN is working and especially in the in the efforts of you know peacekeeping peace uh, peace building for the future so um, yeah, so this is and and then in the on the planetary level, uh, I think that we shouldn't forget these other actors that are really important. So one of those, uh, all these uh, you know global humanitarian uh, actors uh, like uh, ICRC, for example, or or this global organization like MSF, some at some um, Doctors Without Borders, uh, and others that are actually. Uh, witnessing uh, the, the effects of climate change and witnessing how uh, how they exacerbate uh, the, the, the the situation uh, on the ground and they have a very important voice and and um, uh, they should be included in all the all the conversations all the conversations that uh, that we are having about you know on on really on the on the planetary level but also uh, just keeping in mind that the, the, the context specific uh, context specific um, uh, um, in, in information, and now I'm just coming to to, to my key uh, key takeaways because what I, I actually had three, and you will see them in my slides when when Dana <laughs> will uh, will will share them with you. But but my my three takeaways from this uh, kind of analysis conversation is first of all, is really we need to. Uh, Connect the dots. We have to really have a very strong analysis, and I, I know that you know Oli is doing a lot of work on on this. Danashi, you as well, you know, working with uh, Adelphi, working with Cipri, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this connecting the dots is not not only should not only happen on the on the level of the issues. So you know, connecting the different uh, security and, and and peace issues in the in the conversation, but also amongst these different actors that you know I just mentioned in the in my previous uh, point on the um, you know when talking about the planetary level because uh, you need to have Everybody, you know, it's all heads on, on deck. Basically, you need you need to have all these different actors uh, included in the conversation, and uh, and not forgetting really because I I I mentioned these this, you know high level actors that say, but really um, uh, local communities are really key there, and 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 learning from them as well in terms of you know the the, the wisdom that's that be that uh, uh, that exists on the ground, like in the in the efforts of. Um, land restoration etc cetera, etc cetera, that are happening you know uh, here and there you know kind of that are different patches around the world uh, my second um, uh, message is really about uh, you know coming from my background as, as a human security uh, expert is really uh, talking in uh, thinking in terms of protection and empowerment so on one hand and very much linked to what i just said protection because because we know that uh, that uh, certain uh, communities everybody's affected by climate change but certain communities are affected more than others and we have to account for this and um, kind of create mechanisms that that actually are able to pro protect to protect those um, and those populations. But secondly, empowerment, precisely reaching out to you know to individuals, to uh, to local communities who are able to provide us with uh, with solutions to to climate change, with solutions to. Uh, uh, to kind of creating better opportunities for peace, uh, for peace in uh, you know on uh, on uh, on different levels, and something that uh, um, I was thinking about when Ananta was doing his uh, his uh, his introduction is uh, this this saying that um, kind of maybe 
you know, uh, Gandhi would agree with me, uh, would be, uh, you know, to say that, you know, the best technology is not a technology. So a lot of these solutions that we have to climate change and that provide the opportunities for, for, for peace building and for, for, for kind of sustaining peace on creating this, this uh, positive peace would be actually reaching out to, you know, to, to nature based solutions uh, instead of uh, really going for the next gadget, you know, that's available while extracting um, uh, minerals that are, you know, based in, in, in areas that are um, that are already affected by by, by different climate uh, by different security challenges. And last but not least, uh, and it's very much connected, of course, to my previous point is that uh, we have to integrate climate change as as vehicle of peace uh, for you know for all our actions and really going and action is is used here on purpose because. We need to go from, uh, from 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 declarations to action, and this is something that is missing. And you know, I've I've been going to all these different conferences and interacting with a lot of people, and everybody is talking how you know we have to go from thinking analysis to action, and uh, and it's kind of still there, you know, even though the, the the pledge is there. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you so much for your attention, and I look forward to your to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. That was a that was a really good overview of various efforts that have been made so far from the international organizations, regional organizations, and as you mentioned, like at planetary scale and regional scale. And uh, so I'm sure that really paves the way for uh, Oli's uh, Oli's talk uh, on some of these uh, specific cases, especially on Afghanistan, on which he has previously worked. So now I would like to invite Oli uh, to give his talk. Yeah. Danashree, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. A real pleasure to be here with you today. Um, and uh, thank you to all of your colleagues and students who've, who've turned up. I, while Anna was speaking, I pulled together a few photos just because rather than a PowerPoint, I thought I would show you what a beautiful country Afghanistan is. Because we're, Anna's done this brilliant overview of some of these links between climate and security, what's happening, um, uh, you know what we need to do about it, how we can think about these these links. And now what we're going to try and do is move into one particular situation that is very much in the news. Um, while I'm doing this, I am going to try. I was trying to share my screen. I don't, Danishri, I don't know if there's a, a special button you can press that allows me to share. Um, if not, no problem. I, you'll just have to look at my face instead, which is much less nice than photos of Afghanistan. So it's yeah, it was, that option is available. So if you see share content, uh, it's an option. I, it's probably on top uh, with an arrow pointing upwards. Do you see? Yeah, that? I've I've been doing. I've been looking at that, and it just it's it's sort of spinning around and not thinking. I'll carry on and I'll try and multitask. And if I can do it, then then we can look at some photos of Afghanistan. You but it was you can send me the photographs, and I can share it from my system. So that's also possible. While okay. you talk, I can I can just keep it ready. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's 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 not a problem. I I think I'll I'll I'll, I'll just launch in, um, and then if we manage to work it, that that'll be great. Um. So look, a pleasure to be here. We're we're talking now about one particular situation. It's obviously very much in the news at the moment since the 15th of August when the Taliban, um, you know, basically the government, uh, the previous government of, of Afghanistan fell um, and the Taliban took over. So it's been, uh, you know, very much in, in the news recently. Um, and, you know, obviously there's, there's Afghanistan is in a period of a huge amount of flux and change at the moment. It's entering into what is a very real humanitarian crisis. Um, 14 million people um, are in urgent need of food aid. Um, and, you know, Afghanistan is facing the sort of result of 43 years of conflict and what that does to a country. And it's, it's an example of how this sort of level of political instability can undermine um, undermine a country. In 1978, before um, before the fall of the Shah, before the first um, the first invasion from Russia or from the USSR at the time, um, Afghanistan had per capita GDPs that were higher than India, Pakistan, um, China, Bhutan, and Nepal. Um, and now uh, Afghanistan's per capita GDP is much smaller. Um, than, than all of those countries. And I think China's per capita GDP is now 18 times that of Afghanistan. So, you know, conflict is development in reverse. And we've seen that over the past 40 years of conflict in Afghanistan, 
that you know it's pulled apart a lot of the 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 capacity and a lot of the the, the sort of livelihood chances and the and people's chances in Afghanistan. So very much in the news, new government. The half of the government is on FBI watch lists or under UN sanctions. Um, the country is facing a huge economic crunch because something like nine billion dollars of Afghan Afghan money is frozen outside of the country um, under under sanctions. Um, and there's there's real debate and uncertainty as to what's going to happen now with the government, whether the government's going to be recognised. The f the early signs are that the Taliban government has is not radically different to the previous government between 1996 and 2001, um, and that it's 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 going back into not respecting um you know the right of education for girls um the right to work for women and so on so it's going to be difficult for the international community i think to recognize this taliban government to work with that government um and and to support afghanistan certainly in the near term so that's the near term situation but at the same time it's in the context of a, a country that is vulnerable uh, is affected by climate change and has a particular geography and a particular history that will shape it over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, regardless of what happens with the Taliban government. And that's what I sort of want to talk about a little bit today, is that we have the short term issues that are very much heading the headlines and affecting where Taliban, where the where Afghanistan is. There is a concentrated humanitarian crisis now. Roughly half the population is in need of humanitarian aid. The snows are going to start coming into um, Afghanistan. There's a desperate need to to get food into some of the high valleys in Afghanistan before people start starving. Um, you know, it's in on the back of um, severe droughts, two droughts over the last five years in Afghanistan. So last year, less than half of the rain um, that would be normal fell in Afghanistan. So it's just a sort of paint a picture of, I guess, the challenge the new government has in front of it um, and some of the constraints that Afghanistan is going to be facing over the next decades. These do not have to be deterministic, but these are things that the international community has to bear in mind. Afghanistan's neighbours have to bear in mind and obviously the Afghan government, whichever that is, has to has to deal with. And so when we looked at the kind of impact of climate change on security in Afghanistan, we're sort of thinking about what it means for the country over the long term. And I guess there's, there's sort of five issues where climate change has a real potential impact on stability in Afghanistan, the ability of Afghanistan to kind of feed itself, to, to, to manage um, its, its borders, to manage its water and so on. And let me just talk about those kind of quickly. And the, the, the first one is that you know, Afghanistan is, for those of you who who, who um, maybe you've been, maybe you haven't, is a landlocked country. It's very, it's high. Two thirds of it is above two and a half thousand meters um, of sea level. It's mountainous. It's extremely arid in places, very diverse, um, you know, geography with uh, something like 40 million people living in it. And it's also a water tower for the region. So it has five major river systems that flow out of Afghanistan in, in all areas. The majority of people live, in, live on, uh, in rural areas and make their living out of agriculture or livestock. The majority of the agriculture is reliant on rain to, to work. So um, that, and the livestock is reliant on rain for the pasture for the livestock to survive. So. Uh, Afghan, the Afghan economy is reliant on rain and re the rain is becoming increasingly um, uncertain and uh, unpredictable. At the same time, people are very vulnerable to big natural disasters that can also be linked to climate change. So avalanches, floods, landslides, droughts, all of these kind of things. So this situation of Afghanistan where you have lots of people living in rural areas, reliant on rain for their lives, their livelihoods, the food on their table, Means that, means that the country is vulnerable to shifts in that climate. The climate is shifting. Um, there's um, 
you know, it's getting hotter, it, that it's getting drier because more water is evaporating out. Um, it's changing the amount of water in the, in, in the region. So the first link is that, that all of those impacts make it more difficult for sort of economic growth, poverty alleviation in, in Afghanistan. Um, is it, you know, a, 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 a sort of separately discernible factor to everything else that's going in Afghanistan? Maybe not, but it's one of those things that is contributing to poverty, contributing to um, internal instability within within Afghanistan. So that's that's the first thing. This, the second thing, and this is where it's a big question now as to how the, the Taliban government deal with this, is as you may know, um, Afghanistan is historically or has recently become a major source of the world's heroin supply. Um, and it's a very good place for growing opium poppies. Um, and it's producing something like 90% of the world's opium. In When the Taliban were in government between 96 and 2001, in an effort to get recognition from the international community, they banned poppy farming. And poppy farming went down quite dramatically over time. Um, recently, they've actually been encouraging poppy farming because they're taxing it and they're making money off it. And so one of the big questions now is what happens with with that poppy farming. Why is this linked to climate change? It's linked to climate change because the poppy is actually quite a good crop in drought conditions. It's more resistant to drought, to unpredictable water than wheat, which is the main food crop in Afghanistan. So, um, you know, in times of uncertainty, in times of instability and in times of unpredictability of weather, for individual farmers living in wherever it may be, Helmand or, or Nimroz or, or Kandahar, actually growing poppy is a strategy for them being able to feed their families, being able to afford school for now their boys, um, alas, not their girls, um, but is, is a strategy for them to survive. And so the second link between climate change um, and security in Afghanistan is this, this whole link to the drug economy, what that means. And obviously that has a big impact on the sort of how the Taliban deals with the drug economy. Um, and obviously that has an impact on everybody else's security um, elsewhere, because then you have, you know, a, a feed into a globalized supply chain of a class A drug that is incredibly damaging for people's health around the world. So, you know, that's this is not just a security issue for Afghanistan. This is a security issue um, for for the entire world or, or the entire planet to use um, to use Anna's Anna's phrase. So, you know, just just last year, the Taliban were making it's estimated they made almost half a billion dollars off taxing opium poppies. Now, in the context where in the context where the the international community has frozen Afghan funds, the Taliban don't have any more money. Um, they might say, well, we're not going to ban poppies. We're going to start exploiting them more, taxing it, making making more money off it. So that's the second big um, issue there. The third one, and I, I, I can't get my photos to work, but if I if I could have shown you my photos, you'll see this beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful countries I've been to. Landscape of mountains and fields and, 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 and villages um, with, uh, you know, green fields where you can get water. No thing, nothing growing where you can't get water. You know, water is life in Afghanistan in these places. Um, and, and food is wealth. Oh, sorry, land is wealth. Water is life. Uh, and so the third area is that in the context of climate change, if there are changes to the availability of water, if there are changes to how much food you can grow in, in um, you know, in the fields, that affects community level relationships over water and land. Now, when we think of Afghanistan and we think of what we read in the news about Afghanistan, we think about you know Taliban attacks or U.S. drone strikes or whatever it might be. Um, and that's those are the things that get the attention of the international community and get the attention of the newspapers. But actually, people's experience in Afghanistan, in villages in Afghanistan, um, is is as often um, of community level fights over land and water. Um, and so there's been some really interesting surveys done when they've actually gone and asked communities, you know, when you experience violence, what do you experience violence violence about?
Um, is it about, you know, guerrilla attacks, Taliban attacks, al Haqqani attacks, or, you know, whatever it might be, or is it something else? And actually, this one survey said, you know, the responses came back. People's experience of violence is over land and water more than anything else. Um, so you have this sort of situation where you have instability, where you have a lot of guns, as you do in Afghanistan, where you have a lack of systems to deal with disputes, where you can go to a court and, and get an agreement over, you know, is this my field or is this your field? That breeds violence and that breeds a, a resolution of that through the gun rather than through through the courts. So again, the potential risk here is that just the changes to rainfall, the changes to land, the changes to where people can grow food um, links into this community level conflict that is actually um, having a very big impact on people's lives. The fourth area um, is that you've got this as I was saying, Afghanistan is 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 a high landlocked country. Um, it's got five major water um, river basins that flow out of the country in each in each direction, um, and so the neighbourhood in which Afghanistan lives, as as you guys know, is a is a tough neighbourhood, um, and one of the reasons why. Um, Afghanistan has had 43 years of conflict is because a lot of different countries have either in, uh, invaded or got involved in Afghanistan and fought proxy battles, um, proxy wars between between them in this in Afghanistan. Um, the trouble for Afghanistan is that it is the source of water for its neighboring countries. And at least some parts of those neighboring countries have a vested interest in Afghanistan not using more of that water, not being able to build dams, extract more water for irrigation and so on. So how do you do that? Well, you encourage or at least turn a blind eye to ongoing instability in Afghanistan because that maintains the status quo. The status quo is better for you as a neighbor of Afghanistan not not you guys, but you know, uh, but it, better for the immediate neighbors of Afghanistan um, in terms of sustaining the amount of water that's going to Afghanistan. So you've seen some incredibly um, unlikely bedfellows in Afghanistan as a result of this. So credible reports of Iran, a Shia regime, funding Taliban Sunni fighters to attack British built dams in Helmand province that was, um, you know, was going to be reducing the amount of water flowing into Iran. So again, it kind of, this is that fourth area of the links between potential climate change and security in the region is, is what does that mean for the neighborhood in which Afghanistan lives? And how does Afghanistan manage transboundary agreements over that water with its neighbours. Now, as you'll know, India and Pakistan have had the Indus Water Treaty, which has survived three you know, active wars between the country. Afghanistan does not have a single, is not really part of a single water treaty uh, of its neighbours. So there's no mechanism for discussing, allocating, agreeing on the use of that water, which is critical for Afghanistan and critical for its neighbours, because many of Afghanistan's neighbours are highly water stressed, reliant on water, worried about what, um, you know, a reduction in water would mean for their own for their own peace and stability. Um, and so part of the challenge and part of the reason why Afghanistan is, you know, coming in, has had 43 years of conflict is because its neighbours haven't had a vested interest in, in encouraging it towards peace. And, and that's one of one small aspect of that is the issue around water, but that can that can also get worse. It's population is increasing, demand is increasing in Afghanistan and all, all the areas around. So it doesn't that negotiation space for dealing with water as an issue in the long term stability of Afghanistan has got smaller. Um, and then the final one, just to take a slightly different tack is one that, that Anna was talking about a little as well, which is we have this, we are in the process of this monumental change in our economies globally, uh, because we've recognized that we have to change the way we produce and, and use energy. So we're moving away from fossil fuel um, 
production as as a mo as a mode of of of, of transportation. Most of us in in our lives, I think, will see the end of the internal combustion engine in everyday use in cars. So you know, by the end of by or by our children's adulthood, um, they you know the the internal combustion engine will be you know almost consigned to a museum. Would be my guess. That has massive impacts on the ways that we use energy um, and what we use to produce that energy. Um, and this means that we're going to change the sort of minerals we need to to use that. So previously there have been you know fights over oil and gas and coal and they, they may carry on. But also now we've got um, a completely changed demand for things like the components for high level technologies. Um, and particularly um, uh, electric vehicle batteries. So lithium is one of those that is becoming ex ex an extremely important critical mineral in, in the country, uh, in, in the global economy. Afghanistan is estimated to have some of the largest supplies of lithium in the world. Um, now, it's not being exploited at the moment. What does that mean for the long term stability of Afghanistan? Can Afghanistan harness that? and make it a real, you know, an engine for its economy, an engine for jobs, um, managing it, you know, using it as a contribution to kind of the green revolution, or does that mean that the there's a risk of, um, of, of, you know, politicians taking it or people fighting over it or that becoming a focus, as has been the, the case elsewhere, of fights over, uh, over the control of that. So, there are these five things that are that are sort of issues for Afghanistan moving forward, regardless of what happens with the Taliban government. Um, and these are the sort of things that actually it would be really good to get your thoughts um, and ideas around what can we do about this. Um, and so with that, Danishri, I, I've sort of given a slightly depressing thing. I think there are some solutions, but I won't go into them now. But I'd, I'd also like to hear from you guys. Back to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Ali. So that that, yeah, really. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's just uh, showing the realistic picture of what's happening in Afghanistan. And actually, I don't know what is the solution considering uh, the situation, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's so fluid. So, uh, yeah, like who is going to really care about environment and climate today in Afghanistan? I'm not sure. I think the international community has to step in and has to push forward uh, this agenda in some way or the other. So I, I don't see uh, I don't see like a positive pathway right now, but hopefully, you know, uh, when and how I don't know the situation improves, maybe yeah, yeah, something may happen. So thank you so much, Oli, uh, for that. Let me now open the floor for questions. Um, I would like to invite uh, our audience to raise your hands uh, if you have questions and I will Call, uh, call upon you to ask the questions. Um, yes, we have a couple of raised hands. Sri Kutan, you want to go first? Uh, he's a student at our department. Yes. Uh, thank you, both of you, for the wonderful lectures. So my questions to Mr. Oli now. So uh, you have been talking of Afghanistan. I would like to know how ethnicities uh, and the different like cultures play a role in uh, conflict in Afghanistan and how the climate uh, change will affect this, the different ethnic groups. You already have the Taliban, which will be taking action against different groups. Uh, I'd like to know your perspective on the like climate change. How will it affect the different ethnicities? Thank you very much. OK, yeah, I think the question you can answer them. I think it's the question of how, you know, all these are again interlinked, like Anna mentioned in the beginning. All these are connecting the dots. Yes, go ahead, Oli. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really it's a really good question. So, I mean, just as a preface to that, Afghanistan is incredibly diverse. Um, as you know, it's 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 got some communities that are Shia, um, some communities that are Sunni. The Taliban um, are overwhelmingly Sunni and the government is overwhelmingly Sunni as well. And that's overlaid with ethnic differences as well. So, again, I, I do not pretend to be, um, you know, an expert in this. And uh, in fact, the most valuable thing I, I learned every time I went to Afghanistan was how little I understood it. And the more I went, the, the, the more I realized how little I understood. So I, I, you know, take what I say with a large pinch of salt. But you have you have this situation where you have, yes, a divided, a divided 
country um, divided in terms of a sectarian divide, ethnic, uh, but between Shia and Sunni and ethnic divides and linguistic divides. So you have, um, you know, the Sunni Pashtuns speak Pashtu um, and the and there's a whole group of Shia um, uh, one of the principal groups of which are the Hazara living in the central, the, the central um, highlands who speak, who speak Dari, which is a form of Farsi and very related to, to in, 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 you know, the Iranian national language. So you have these, these existing tensions. Um, and often these, and you know, the ideological differences and the fact that the, the Taliban think that Shia is a, an you know, an apostate version of, of Islam are certainly, you know, bigger drivers of conflict than climate change in Afghanistan. And what I certainly don't want to do is leave the impression that climate change is the big issue in Afghanistan at all. It is one of those things that's changing the context that is creating the conditions in which other things happen. If we, if we say it's all about climate change, then we kind of take away the fact that humans fire guns, human make humans make choices. Um, in fact, mostly men make choices about 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 fighting and, and killing. So so let's just put that really importantly. We don't want to sort of overstate the role of climate change. That being said, different groups in Afghanistan have very different livelihoods. Um, and that has led to clashes between groups um, that you can imagine getting worse both as a result of the kind of general level of insecurity in the country um, and the prevailing political situation but also climate change let me give you an example so in the central areas of 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 the central highlands of afghanistan is mostly where the hazara uh, a shia diary speaking group live um, traditionally have been persecuted were heavily persecuted lots of very serious um, quasi genocidal massacres during the Taliban you know um, rule last time have been traditionally very persecuted by by um, by the Taliban and by sort of extremist ideologues on on the on the Taliban side um, they are traditionally uh, farmers um, sedentary farmers in their area, traditionally, Sunni, a Sunni um, uh, nomadic pastoralist group goes through called the Kuchi. Um, and so you have linguistic difference, livelihood difference, sectarian difference. Now, there have been lots of fights and battles and killing between Kuchis who basically with the seasons move their livestock through Hazara areas. Um, and this is a, an old story of um, of different groups having fights over different over the same resources at the same time. Now, uh, you know, with with um, climate change changing where the life where pasture can be found, you know, the Kuchi still need to find livestock of need to, still need to find pasture for their for their goats um, and and some of their other livestock. And so, again, it puts these groups into more and more direct competition. So not necessarily saying this is the major reason for sectarian or ethnic division between the countries, or between the different groups, but you can see how this sharpens things, makes it more difficult, reduces that space for negotiation and some kind of win-win solution between the communities. Yeah, thank you, Wally. Uh, we will move on to the next question by Kiran, uh, who's also a postgraduate student at our department. Hi, good evening. Uh, it was a great lecture from both the speakers. My question is first for Ms. Anna. So should you uh, should UNSC be dealing with uh, climate security? That's my first question. The second question I have is, do you think there is a direct link between advancing climate change and worsening poverty, especially in the global south? And my third question is like, what measures can be adapted to ensure smooth financing for adapting uh, the climate change strategies? Because we see measures such as carbon financing is being met with heavy resistance. These are my three questions for Anna. And I have one small question for uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Oli Brown. That is like, you did bring about the topic of rare, uh, rare earth minerals such as uh, lithium in Afghanistan. So do you think the gamble between the superpowers to extract those minerals will affect the peace process in Afghanistan? If at all, there is any peace there. Thank okay. you. 
Yeah, thanks, Kiran. Uh, let me just club it with one. Actually, I think Induja has a similar question to what Kiran asked. Induja, do you want to go ahead and ask the question? Um, yes. Yeah. So, uh, thank you both the speakers for the lecture. So, my question is something somewhat similar to what Kiran asked. It's like uh, the Chinese VRA projects in Afghanistan, especially with uh, Taliban withdrawing from uh, Taliban currently having control in Afghanistan. Uh, so, what do you think are the environmental impacts that China, uh, env environmental impacts that would uh, Afghanistan face, especially with Chinese investments in uh, rare earth mines and rich minerals? So the environment impacts the Chinese project. That was my question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Anna, you want to go ahead and answer first? Sure. I just I just need a clarification on the first question. Uh, I didn't hear it well. Uh, that I heard the one. Should the U should the UNSC be dealing with climate security uh, because of I guess you know because of all the various complications and controversies around you know, the P5 and various countries yeah. which are yet, you know, reluctant. I think that's the question. I, you yeah. know, I think it's like from my standpoint, it should. But then, you know, realistically, uh, I actually don't see it happening, at least for the time being, like not in a like, of course it does because it does. It's, you know, there was a, a resolution on, on, on the Sahel. There was also a resolution on Afghanistan when they did they that the environmental issues, of course, are factored in in the, you know, in these context specific approaches in the in the resolutions that are on the, um, um, you know, on the on the specific security situations that the United Nations Security Council deals with. But at the same time, uh, I don't see much prospect of having there this, uh, you know, this generic uh, resolution on climate and security. And what I've seen and kind of what I'm hearing as well is that countries, you know, because of this, um, this um, resistance, you know, from some of the states, they are actually trying to go around it and, you know, talk more about, you know, other issues like water, you know, that is being impacted by by, by climate change. But there is no, you know, but here as well, you know, it's, it's context specific rather than a generic one. So I think it's like from my standpoint, it should, but I don't I don't think it's, it's going to happen anytime soon unless there is something kind of like a really on a planetary level that impacts everybody. And then, you know, the, 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 the realization is there because because what I hear from, you know, at least, you know, if, I, I really recommend you go and listen to this uh, to, to, to this uh, uh, discussion uh, last week. I think it was last week or two weeks ago. And, uh, mm, you know, where Russia and China are really very clearly stating that, you know, for them, it's not really a security issue as such. You know, it impacts some situations so context specific. Yes, but not a general one. But, you know, uh, Oli might might have a different uh, different approach to this. Uh, secondly, the connection between between climate and, and poverty. So, of course, you know, like when I was speaking about the about the um, disproportionately heating uh, uh, vulnerable groups, uh, you know, the, the climate change heating disproportionately uh, vulnerable groups like minorities like uh, women and children uh, you know and there is a lot of research being done around it it also um, it also hits more poor people and uh, and and this is you know this is why the SDG agenda is actually integrating all of these different goals so that we can address uh, address these issues uh, uh, these issues together so I think that you know climate action, but re but intelligent climate action in terms of you know precisely not exacerbating local uh, um, uh, local um, communities uh, tensions or you know uh, going for the extract uh, e extraction in, in in areas when there is already a security tension can actually be a, 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 an opportunity to alleviate people from, uh, from from poverty and you know and of course and and very much linked to uh, to your third question about the cl uh, climate finance. Of course, you know the, the the action is very highly under um, uh, under uh, under under finance. So you know there are pledges, but these pledges have not uh, have not been met. And now with the uh, with with the COVID pandemics and kind of the prioritization of the security responses, rather than you know uh, thinking in terms of of of, uh, of climate and. To my point about the long strategic, uh, long term strategic thinking, uh, I think it's uh, we we are lagging behind. But you know there is this uh, hope of uh, not hope. I think I think that countries at the same time are are kind of realizing, uh, especially with 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 all the natural disasters happening around the world, including in Europe. And I think this will kind of make people maybe reflect a little bit more and 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 take more concrete actions. There is some hope for the for the Glasgow uh, Glasgow uh, COP conference of the UNFCCC, um, but I don't know if I'm uh, 
the, the problem with climate financing and, uh, you know, those of you who are interested I, I, next summer uh, that GCSP is going to run the Summer Academy on Land, Climate and, and, and Security, where we are actually, we have a the component on climate finance. And, uh, and when we're discussing the, 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 uh, the, the, um, uh, the criticism of this, of this whole mechanism is that it's so complicated that for people, for local communities, it's really uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to, to, to access this financing. And, uh, and uh, there, is, there is a need for more uh, local level um, uh, actions or, or mechanisms to allow for, for example, you know, local farmers to access this financing and kind of address uh, their, uh, their 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 um, their challenges, you know, on the on their level, and this is this is one of the the, the challenges of the of this big kind of high level uh, climate financing that is uh, um, that is in place now. Okay, I'll stop here and uh, give Oli the floor. Yeah, Oli. Okay, well, thank you very much. I mean, I'm just going to be really. You, you, the question was this, you know, around, around. I guess the the, the superpower gamble in Afghanistan, um, and what the environmental impacts of this. And I know we're just a, a small group and some, you know, amongst these four digital closed walls. So I can be speak very frankly with you. Um, you know, we. I mean, originally, originally the the original sort of pitch on Afghanistan's uh, geological wealth came out in about 10 years ago because the, the US Geological Survey did this did this assessment of Afghanistan and said there's a trillion dollars worth of minerals in this country and it was done because the US wanted to show how Afghanistan could be economically self-standing uh, and self-sustaining after some kind of eventual US pull out and so they were trying to say well look Afghanistan's got a whole lot going for it uh, and it's got these 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 huge amounts of minerals at the time there was a huge push by the international community to help afghanistan put in place systems to manage uh, minerals and to start bringing in investment creating revenue you know producing jobs and so on and there were two big there two very big um you know a sort of projects being being developed one uh, a big copper mine just southwest of of um of kabul called Ainak, and another one a big iron ore mine in the central highlands called hajikak um and so you know there was this so far to my knowledge there hasn't been much extraction or any real sort of scoping of afghanistan's potential as a kind of green mineral producer there is this idea that it has vast quantities of lithium and one of the top five countries in the world, maybe even the top three countries in the world in terms of supplies of lithium. Any For any country to, to, to have large scale extraction, you tend to need at least a degree of stability, um, perhaps less so than some other areas of your economy, because you can fence off mines, but um, you, you, you sort of want to have a degree of stability. So there's, there's a sort of, there's a lot of reticence of um, uh, from some of the big mining companies of going into Afghanistan, even 10 years ago, even when it felt more, more, um, you know, m more interesting. I mean, and now obviously the, the political situation is so difficult that I think any of the big companies would be very, very hesitant to 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 go into Afghanistan. What that means is that those country, those those companies that are there or that might come in the next few years are going to be the small companies, the kind of cowboy companies that perhaps have much lower um, environmental standards. And whether they're Chinese or any other country, uh, any, you know, from any, anywhere else that it's, it's not necessarily a nationality thing. It's more of a sort of size and, a, and the ability of the government to manage those companies well. So there are potentially really, really serious environmental issues of lots of different types of mining. So INAC, the big copper mine, was bought up by a Chinese company um, and uh, has never really been, you know, extracted or used or developed um, and didn't sort of live up to its promise for a whole number of reasons. Had it started to be used, there were estimates that it could have used as much water as or as much as two thirds of the water that Kabul uses in a water stressed area. So, you know, potentially really serious environmental challenges, um, risks for environmental pollution. As you may know, rare earth minerals, and depending on which mineral you're extracting, 
can have extremely bad environmental consequences as well. There's, uh, in many um, rare earth minerals are extracted by something called heap leach mining, which is where you basically, pile, it's very simple, you pile a big pile of uh, ore in, 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 in a big mountain and then pour acid over it and then, and then it leaches out the rare earths which you can extract from the liquid at the bottom. It's potentially extremely damaging if you do it badly. Um, so there's real risks environmentally for Afghanistan. There's real risks um, politically and economically for Afghanistan. I don't see, frankly, that there's a big superpower gamble, frankly, for, for you know, I, I don't think there's some kind of big nefarious plan from either China or Russia or the US or anybody else to kind of create instability in Afghanistan to grab its minerals per se. I think more it's just been an effort, particularly by the US, to show that Afghanistan had some resources that could you know, provide an economic backbone in future. Um, but these are things that are going to be shaping the, the prospects of the country for the next 10, 20 years and, and how this government or whatever government takes its place um, manages these mineral resources is going to is going to have a deterministic impact on Afghanistan's prospects. Back to you. Yeah, thank you, Wally. Uh, I, I don't know, Satyam, are you there? You had raised your hand earlier. Uh, if you would yes, like. Yes, to... yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you for. Yes. Uh, hi, and I'm Oli. Thank you for the presentation. So I just want to ask uh, uh, both of you, and I'm using uh, uh, some similar phrase which only use conflict is reverse of development. I think uh, you use that. Uh, I, I want to ask at whose behest. And when I'm asking it at whose behest, I'm actually going to ask in terms of, say, just transition. Just transition. And I'm asking from Afghanistan only. Let's take example from Afghanistan only. The, 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 the idea of EVs, the idea of batteries that we are, we, we are, we're going to need are coming from Afghanistan. Say, for instance, the material. So I'm asking at whose behest we are uh, we're going to have this kind of transition. When you say economic, uh, uh, there's going to be a change in how we use energy, right? So at whose behest we are changing? At the behest of Global South, those, those at the behest of Global South. And, and these Global South participants don't even have voice. If you're given, if, if I'm not, if the institutions are, are, the, are these institutions going to be uh, just enough so that their voices can be heard. Can the West, which always talks about, yes, climate change is happening and we are going to switch from fossil fuel to, say, non-fossil fuel based energy or uh, uh, energy systems, can, can being, being morally on the right stand, they will not use the kind of products which are actually not uh, which are extracted at the behest of Global South. Will your EV bike, which is there running, will have extracted from the poor people of conflict ridden Afghanistan? No. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you want to like take a couple of questions because we are running out of time, if that's fine with you? Yeah, OK. Uh, Priyanka, go ahead. You may ask your question. Good evening. Uh, thank you to both the speaker for such a wonderful uh, session. Uh, my question is to Miss Anna. Ma'am, my question is uh, regarding the interlinkages between climate change and migration. And I wanted to know if there are any international, you know, legally binding agreements which oblige uh, countries to, you know, support climate migrants. And considering that uh, climate migrants have yet not received a refugee status under the UNHCR. So I wanted uh, you to reflect upon how has UN been engaging with the issue of climate migration so far? Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, OK, so maybe we will start with Oli one uh, and then uh, Anna can answer Priyanka's question. Yeah. Um, you, you've asked one of the big questions um, and, and I don't have a good answer for you, frankly. I mean, you know, at, at whose behest is, is the green transition taking place? I guess there's, there's just two things to say, which are perhaps fairly self-evident one is is what Anna was talking about which is you know the, the whole point of these climate change negotiations is to change the way that we produce and use energy and it's doing that by trying to change 
collectively and individually a whole series of de decisions uh, and uh, about you know that energy use and the incentives around that so you know ultimately whether, whether it's at the behest of the north the south the east or the west um we have an objective danger in the sense of climate change and we know where that danger comes from and we know what we need to do to change it and it's a collective action problem to try and to to, to try and do so so there were these incentives that are being shifted around where we get our energy from but at the same time i mean and this is i guess what i was talking about when i was saying we're in the middle of this amazing transition we'll look back on i think in 20 30 years and think wow that was this was epoch shifting stuff um is that you know just a, well, a couple of years ago it became it became cheaper and easier to add energy through renewables than through fossil fuels um and you know it's the economic argument is 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 changing things now this is the ball is rolling on this um you might you'll be familiar with moore's law about the the increase every 18 months in the the kind of computing power um of of average chips we have a similar thing um in terms of the reductions in in in, in renewable energy costs and so the the machine that is now changing this is 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 the economics of renewable energy now that renewable energy requires a, a whole series of minerals that we haven't his, historically had to use so much of and that's where these geopolitical impacts come and i guess it's incumbent on all of us working in this area to try and understand anticipate and manage those geopolitical impacts so that this energy transition isn't on the backs of impoverished people affected by violence in afghanistan but regardless of the test question this this energy system is changing faster than i think we realize back to you yes anna okay uh for me thank you like i just wanted to address this first question that i i was mentioning it a little bit in my in my presentation is like I, I, I would all like you to, to research uh, uh, an excellent uh, analyst. Uh, her name is Olivia Lazar, and uh, she's one of the, the most interesting thinkers in terms of this, this transition when she talks about precisely the fact that we are focusing so much on the, on the carbon cycle and, you know, kind of reducing the, the emissions and we are not thinking about uh, enough about the water cycle. So we have to also think in terms of really this uh, kind of biosphere and and the the, uh, the the services of the of the of the um, uh, of the of the environment to uh, you know to our different uh, to our different system first of all and secondly precisely what what uh, Oli just mentioned you know this extraction of this uh, of 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 the metals that we have not been um, uh, doing so far so much of until now and and a lot of those are being uh, are actually placed in uh, in uh, in uh, risk uh, in risk areas so and 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 it's a it's a real question you know me being uh, being european and coming from very comfortable and speaking to you from a very comfortable uh, uh, geneva uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, you know it's it's kind of difficult uh, because uh, because I understand, I, I really understand your question and your 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 your, your worry because because this uh, this transition can be actually happening at the expense of the of the global south. And I think that for the time being, at least in the discourse of different of different at least European uh, um, organizations, uh, I think that we are really focusing a lot on this um, technological and uh, and of course you know that the the, the, the the prices of the of the renewables are decreasing but you know but in order to build batteries we will need this uh, lithium and uh, and uh, and there's going to be uh, there's going to be a, an important i think negotiation in the uh, in glasgow and in future cops uh, you know where we have to have this this just transition uh, a little bit um, accounted for so so now it's actually a role of 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 you know of of groupings like BRICS, of of groupings like uh, you know the the independent states like the island states as well you know who are who will need to be a little bit more uh, uh, forceful in 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 pushing for this and you know i know it's, it sounds very naive and 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 uh, kind of <laughs> wishing uh, wish wishful thinking but, but 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 i think that there is there is no there is no other uh, there is no other choice but also you know in you have an opportunity in speaking to this uh, to for example european uh, actors such as nato such as uh, you know in the in the in the in the framework of the partnership for peace uh, or you know where where there are countries who are outside of the nato space or uh, in the context of the oec which also has a lot of a lot of different um uh, 
partners around the world or even the EU uh, and, and kind of making them realize that, you know, this transition cannot be done at the expense of the of, of the global south, because I'm afraid that actually what we are seeing now, it's uh, it's actually going to this direction. Um, I, I think that we are a little bit, again, short-sighted in this, uh, in, in thinking about this, while, you know, uh, accounting for the fact that, you know, that, of course, the, 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 the renewable sources, uh, renewable uh, sources of energy need to be, uh, um, uh, need to be the, the, the major part of the energy mix for the, for the future world, right, if, if we want to get it right. Um, and happy to agree to disagree with uh, anybody <laughs> uh, on this. Uh, and secondly, for the for the question about the, the movement, because I don't like to talk about migration only. I I I, I really like. I'm actually running a course soon on uh, that that I called movement of people and security, because because for me, movement of people is a lot of these different categories of people that you know. Some of them have this uh, in uh, international law um, kind of. Um, uh, place like like refugees. Uh, then you have the migrants that really don't, you know, uh, except from the non-binding uh, uh, compact for for global migration, you really don't have any any treaty, international treaty dealing with those. Then you have the third category, which is IDPs. That is the category that's actually the the, the, the most uh, uh, the the, um, the quickest growing uh, category of these people on the move now uh, now in the world, and especially. Uh, due to, to to different consequences of climate change. So, for example, you know, in uh, in disasters, in natural disasters, most people are actually moving within uh, uh, um, within uh, borders of a given country. They are not moving across the borders. Or if they do, it's for a short period. You know, before they you know they they manage to go back to their uh, to to their um, uh, to their villages or you know to, to to their localities. So so we have to you know. So this is the first point. And secondly, you know, on the on the international on the international level, on the international law. Uh, there is nothing really that, that accounts for so so you know so so global compact for migration it does talk a little bit about about uh, environmental uh, you know people who move because of environmental issues but at the same time you also have to remember that you know it's not a clear cut kind of category because these people are moving for several different reasons it's 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 very rarely only because of climate change it's very rarely only because of of and 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 we don't have still. Uh, enough research done. So IOM, so International Organization for Migration, has a pilot program on, you know, kind of observing these movements of people. Uh, they call it environmental um, migration. Uh, they don't they don't call it climate change. Uh, when it comes to, to, to refugees, uh, you know, when you talk to people from the, the High Commissioner for, for Refugees in, in Geneva, they are very resistant to, to, to using the term uh, environmental uh, refugees or climate, uh, climate refugees because it, it simply doesn't, uh, doesn't apply to the, to, to, the, uh, to the convention under which they are they're working. And uh, of course, there are people who are looking at this. Of course, there are people who are uh, kind of uh, anal analyzing this, but as uh, as international law, they don't have the man mandate to actually address this category of, of, of people. So if you are moving because of um, because of so now, you know, we are going to see uh, growing numbers of, for example, Afghan uh, refugees moving. So, you know, they are going to be seen as, as, as refugees and but some of them will be also moving because of the, you know, the, 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 the reasons that, that Oli was uh, mentioning in his uh, in his um, uh, presentation. So on the international level, unfortunately, you don't have anything. And, you know, I, I, I tend to be a little bit um, um, uh, yeah, pessimistic in, in these terms because I, I very often tell my students that, you know, if we were to uh, negotiate the, um, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights right now, uh, it wouldn't fly, you know, in the, in the, in the current uh, context. So I actually don't see any major uh, international negotiation that will create uh, such an international law. Uh, and what's interesting, it, again, you know, after me watching the, the, uh, the speeches of different organize, uh, of different uh, countries uh, in the, in the uh, General Assembly, you know, the, the, the country that is speaking most for the international law is Russia. Interesting, right? Uh, you know, when, when you listen to, 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 to um, Minister Lavrov or, or, or President Putin, that they always talk about the international law and how it's important to. So 
just 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 the thought there and but last but not least for for for, for this uh for this part is also you you also have to look um on local solutions so for example you know this person that won a, a process in a, in a new zealand i believe you know that you know that they they said that you know they had to move because of climate change and they actually won won a process in a in a, in a new zealand uh, court uh, there are um, there are pro provisions that you know island states uh, small island states are already starting to do you know on their like in bilateral uh, relations with uh, with other countries so these things are happening because actually people have to react to the realities on the ground but i on the international level i actually don't see it happening uh, because also of this general you know um, atmosphere in the on the multilateral level right okay i shut up <laughs> yeah uh, so we are past time, but if it's OK with both of you, we can take like one round of questions more. That's fine. Yeah, OK. Uh, Aishwarya, please uh, go ahead and ask your question and keep it brief. Yeah. Thank you, Sharon, ma'am. It was really wonderful lecture and gave us many thoughts to ponder upon. Sir, I would like to know further upon how the climate change aids for the terror financing in Afghanistan. And I, would like, I read a report on how Taliban has been successful in getting a hold on the local farmers. So I would like to know your view on how do you think the poppy cultivation community would come out of it for their livelihood as they are more into it because of the drought and climatic conditions. Uh, climate change. So what's your view upon that? And ma'am, you have already partially answered the question in your previous comments, but if you want to add any of it, so I'd like to know your experience of working with the professionals on climate change, security and peace and how they are receptive and how are their perspective? Thank you. Ma'am. OK, uh, Malvika. Hello, ma'am and sir. Uh, that talk was very delightful. I think we all learned a lot today. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I actually want to ask a question on behalf of one of my classmates, Teresa. Uh, she asks, like, in the conversation of adding women as decision makers to climate change efforts, in the prominent reasoning given is that women are inherently peaceful and in tune with nature. Do you think that this is cultural ecofeminist narrative or is it reductive? What are your comments on it? Yeah, OK, uh, so these are the last set of questions, so you may take them. Molly, you want to go first? Sure, very quickly. Um, I'm thank, thank you for the point about the kind of terror financing um, and the opium. And this is one of the things I touched on, you know, last year, as I was saying, you know, the Taliban made four hundred and sixty million dollars estimated out of taxing the trade in opium. The big question is what happens now um, and and who knows, frankly, it's your guess is as good as mine. Um, it, you know, maybe they'll crack down on on um, on the on opium. Um, my guess is that they probably won't um that they probably won't have many other sources of revenue um it, this is a group that is moving from having been a guerrilla group for the last 20 years to having to manage a government and provide services and so they are going to be looking around for money wherever they are the international community is providing humanitarian aid but not any development or security funding or anything else like that so and and my guess is that will be the same for for the near term as well so the, the big question is where did they get the money from um, and and um, you know given that they'll want to try and keep sort of farmers in the south on side um, who have been growing poppy um, they won't want to start I don't think going in and having sort of big eradication programs so my guess is that'll carry on and they'll carry on making money out of it as they do out of other things they make money out of talc and marble and taxing um, you know, taxing border posts. So this is just one other thing that that, that they can tax and make money from. Um, and yeah, that's I think that's going to be continue to be an issue for the world community. Um, on on the second question around uh, involving women in 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 discussions around security, um, climate security uh, decisions. I mean, I think that's that's very prominent in some of the discussions on this not in Afghanistan because of the new government. Um, so that is that certainly I think that's the exception of the rule. The, the best summary I've I've heard of this um, is a, it was a poster quote, but is is you can make war without women, um, but you can't make peace without women. And I think that really 
that really kind of makes sense. Men are very good at conducting violence. They're not very good at build, building peace. And so if you want to address the security impacts of climate change, you have to involve women as much, if not more than men. Back to you. Yeah, Anna, you can just thank you. Thank you so much, Oli. And I just wanted to say on the on the second question, you know, had, had you ever met Oli in person, you would say, you know, we need more men like this who are actually thinking in, uh, about peace and you know how to uh, how to um, uh, yeah address address uh, these issues. At the same time, you know, of course, like I agree completely with Oli. You know, we have to uh, involve women, but I I wouldn't say that it's it, it should be at uh, at the expense of 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 also involving men because I think that there is an education uh, piece there that is really really important in terms of. Also, you know, how do we educate boys? You know, kind of starting really for, for, from a, from a very early, a very early age, and kind of incentivizing uh, everybody to like we are all in this together. So I'm I, I actually do find it uh, problematic when you say you know that women are inherently peaceful and men are less. Uh, I I don't think it's 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 the case. I think inherently we are all peaceful and there is, you know, and we all go through the programming that, you know, the different programming in different societies we are living in and then and then we add up the product of, of this in a way, you know, of, for, of course accounting also for our personal traits, uh, which is, you know, this is my kind of uh, yoga uh, path that's speaking here because because I really think that everybody has a has a has an opportunity to, uh, to, 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 to really contribute to peace and we all have the potential to do it. Even the, the, the worst people, you know, I, I really truly deeply believe that everybody can change uh, you know you just need good uh, conditions for that um, of course it's yeah no, I'm being very reductionist here but 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 you know what I mean uh, on the first question I, I I'm not sure if I if I understood it right because it's you are talking about provisions for peace and uh, for, for, for peace uh, or for, 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 for climate and security for me, in general, so you know, I did mention it in my in my presentation, so I don't want to I don't want to uh, um, repeat it. But one of the main points I would say is really this future thinking, planning for different futures, and uh, and I think that you know there is increased thinking on this, you know, on all all levels, but not enough yet. Uh, when you speak to people from the, for example, from the UN, so, you know, there are some agencies who are thinking about it, but there are some agencies who are completely, you know, oblivious of, of the need of, of doing of doing that. Um, and I'm not going to go into details of which uh, agencies I'm, I'm talking about, but um, uh, also at the level of countries, on the individual countries, you know, there are some countries who are much better, you know, you take a small country like uh, uh, like Finland, for example, in Northern Europe, which which is very, really uh, very uh, very good, and you know, it's at strategic thinking, strategic planning, and I think that you, you know the military actually we can learn a lot from the military uh, or in uh, in this in this regards. But what I really wanted to say that in terms of addressing climate, peace, and security, so kind of this this security sector has more more of the role of precisely informing, uh, doing analysis, planning and informing the conversation because because the actual fact of preventing, uh, uh, you know, the disaster, uh, the disaster that climate change or dangerous climate change can uh, can can cause will be actually in other parts of the society because, you know, it's not the military, like, of course, military can change its procurement uh, um, policies, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, or decrease its, uh, uh, its, um, um, uh, its emissions. But at the same time, I think that the most of the work will be done elsewhere, like, you know, with the political processes, with, uh, you know, with, uh, with precisely what's happening in Glasgow. The, the, the conversations around, you know, the, the, the process of the UNFCCC doesn't really talk that much about security as such that like you would be you know interested to, to to know that you know in the in the Paris agreement security I think the word security is actually mentioned only once in the context of, uh, of food security um, so so I think it's kind of that the, the security sector is going to prepare the ground they inform the, the you know kind of scare people even into action which you know I, I I'm not a proponent of but but I think that there is some you know kind of uh, realization of, of, of the threats that needs to be made but but at the same time that the, the, the nitty-gritty of the action is not going to happen there it's going to ha happen in other parts of society and uh, yeah I will finish here yeah okay thank you so much so we are like 
yeah, 13 minutes past the time, but I'm I'm uh, I'm sure you know you both the speakers didn't really mind spending that extra time just answering these questions. Thank you so much for patiently answering all the questions from students and uh, uh, the audience. Uh, so I'll just you know finish. Uh, I'll just end the session with a formal vote of thanks to the speakers and the audience. Thank you so much, Anna and Dolly for agreeing uh, and you know accepting the invitation to come and speak um, uh, and you know uh, it's a, it's a pleasure to really host you virtually and uh, i think this is the first time that I've, uh, we have done this actually this is the first time that the university has actually uh, you know organized an event on climate change and peace we have a lot of events around peace but this is the first time that we are like linking it to climate change as well and i'm very happy that i i i could invite both of you and you agreed to be here virtually, but hopefully, you know, sometime in the future you will, can also visit us <laughs> and uh, thank you so much. I would also like to extend my gratitude to all my uh, uh, all my uh, colleagues and the head of the department in particular, Dr. Nankishore, who gave the welcome remarks and also helping us coordinate the session and organizing the session and uh, uh, the, the, the management of the university as well, the, the top leadership, which has encouraged us a lot in terms of you know, organizing and also doing something like both of you mentioned action on climate change when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to the activities of various uh, departments as well as the Center for Climate Studies that I'm co-coordinating. And uh, last but not the least, I would like to thank my students and uh, the audience for uh, for attending the session and asking really good questions, uh, which I'm sure, you know, both the speakers have been able to answer and and you know, I will be happy to share both their email IDs with the students in case they would like to know more about some of the issues they discussed, um, especially because this semester we have the course on geopolitics, security and environmental change. This is the semester where I'm teaching that course. So there are quite a few students who have opted for that course. And you know, it's always good to see the level of enthusiasm among the students to understand these issues better. So thank you one, one and all, and I hope to see you again. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye now. Bye.